Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we've got a really interesting show today, and we really haven't covered this topic, and that is high-profile families mm -hmm. that have had a loss versus the rest of us like uh, we were, where our son w died, but not wasn't high profile. It made yeah. the news for a day. Right, and, it, and I'm Local. so interested in this, because you know I worked with 9-11 families for 10 years, the firefighter families that lost someone in the Trade Center, and there are similarities, and then there are differences. So we have two guests today that had their loved ones die in different ways, but they were both very public and high profile, mm -hmm. and we will talk to them about maybe the unique challenges they had or what was similar and what was different. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be really interesting. One of the losses happened when you were just a baby, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the Rockefeller family, and why don't you introduce Mary first? I will, so we've had Mary before on our show and on our radio show. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mary. Um, this is Mary Rockefeller Morgan, and she is a licensed psychotherapist and certified imagery guide and trainer. She has had a general psychotherapy practice in Manhattan since 1991. Mm -hmm and is now specializing in bereavement counseling and twin loss because mm -hmm. her twin died. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary lectures on twin loss and has led a bereavement group for twins whose twin died in the 9-11 World Trade Center attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, she is the executive producer of a forthcoming documentary on genetic determinism and the American dream, and she is married, has three children and seven grandchildren. Wow, all right, yes. well welcome to the show, Mary. Thank you. Now Hi, let's in, let's introduce Ma uh, Scarlett and okay. kind of move on with her story, and then I'm going to get back to Mary because I remember your story, Mary, so well. I was riveted as the whole United States was when your brother was lost in New Guinea in the '60s. Yeah, yeah. And you wouldn't know because you were a little well, baby. Well, but I heard about it later. Yeah. And I remember hearing about it and going, "Oh, that's so interesting. That's so different, and it's weird. What happened?" I remember thinking that. Mm -hmm. I um, mean, yesterday we went to the Met oh, yes. and saw the exhibit. If, if anyone out there uh, goes to New York City, please visit the Met because it is phenomenal what your brother brought back from New Guinea. New New Guinea. It was just it's, unbelievable. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we get on with our and second next, guest? And next, we are going to interview Scarlett Lewis. And Hi, Scarlett. Hi, Scarlett. Hello. Hi. We just did a wonderful webinar with Scarlett, and she's mm -hmm. been on our show as well on our radio. And her son, Jesse, died in Sandy Hook in the school shootings. Mm -hmm. And he was a hero. Very tragic. Because he told a lot of the kids to run and saved a lot of lives. Just six years old. And it's amazing. Yeah, such a sad, sad story. It, it really is. And uh, she's written a book, A Mother's Journey of Hope and Forgiveness. I'm totally blown away by her level of forgiveness and her level mm -hmm. of hope and where she is, given what's happened. Yeah. Um, it's a really positive lesson for so many out there. And when we did the webinar, the feedback I got was it was the best one that we've ever done mm -hmm. because there were so we many people that harbored so much anger and were able to let a lot of it go. And so. we did that in partnership with the Compassionate Friends, which by the way, they are in partnership with us on this show. And you can go to our site, opentohope.com, to watch that webinar. And Alan Peterson, executive director of the Compassionate Friends, does it with us, and, and what a forgiveness message. Absolutely, forgiveness and, message. and lastly, she's the founder of the Jesse Lewis Choose Love Organization. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. welcome Scarlett. Welcome Thank Scarlett. You. Thanks for having well, me. Well, for folks who don't know, talk a little bit <clears throat> about uh, your son and his lo your loss. Yeah, so uh, Jesse was six, and uh, uh, he died alongside 19 of his classmates yeah. and six teachers and administrators on December 14th, 2012. So we're coming up on the four wow. year anniversary mm -hmm. in one of the worst mass shootings in US history. Mm -hmm. Wow. Boy, at anniversary, that's a toughie. Yeah, it's a toughie Christmas and anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and four years is not a very long time. No. When you think you're gonna have your little boy in your life, you know, right. until you die, basically. Right. Yeah. Now talk a little bit about the shooter too for folks who don't know. He shot himself, right? And he did. Uh, the shooter's name was Adam Lanza, and he was, uh, I think, 21 years old. And he um, was a, a former student of, of Newtown schools, including Sandy Hook Elementary. Mm -hmm. His mother actually taught at Sandy Hook mm -hmm. Elementary. So that morning he got up and shot his mother wow. while she was sleeping, uh, went to the school. Uh, proceeded to um, shoot 20 first graders in two first grade classrooms and then six teachers and administrators and then he turned the gun on himself. Wow. wow. 
Now, I know when we did the webinar, you said that you have forgiven him. Would you, is that enough to say? I mean, is forgiveness <laughs> really, you know? Yes, really and truly. And, uh, you know, I, I, Jesse had written a message on our kitchen chalkboard that I found a couple days after he died. Mm -hmm. um, and he wrote three words, nurturing, healing, love. And he and was just six. He was six. And, and those words aren't normally three words that a six-year-old would put together. Right. They were phonetically spelled because he was in first grade and just learning to write. But I really, I really um, gained a lot of knowledge from that message. I saw it and knew that um, I just, I knew instinctively that if Adam Lanza, the shooter, could have given and received nurturing, healing love, that the tragedy would never have happened. Mm -hmm. So I knew, I knew one thing that I was going to be spending the rest of my life spreading that message. That that message was maybe a spiritual awareness that Jesse had that he wasn't going to be on Earth for very much longer, um, and and it was certainly comforting to us to 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 see that message in mm -hmm. particular. And say um, that message again. Nurturing, healing, healing. love. Wow. Wow. So phonetically spelled, and it looks like a first grader wrote it, but it's very mm -hmm, certain clear. what it says. It's very clear, and um, and and I. I I, I knew instinctively also that for somebody to have done something as heinous as Adam Lanza, that he must have been in a tremendous amount of pain. I mean, mm -hmm. I really felt that uh, right off the bat. And I've learned since the tragedy that that was the case. Uh, mm -hmm. He was horribly bullied um, all throughout his schooling. He um, never got the services and attention that he needed, even though he cried out for help. There were red flags all along the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and it's 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 sad. Um, mm -hmm. And I hope that we can learn from that experience and, mm -hmm. and something like that will never happen again. That's my hope. Now tell me about your organization and you've written a book. Yes, so I wrote a book called Nurturing Healing Love and actually it came mostly from my journal which I started right away, about a week after Jesse died. I was, all these incredible things were happening. I mean, our, our tragedy was so high profile. We had mm -hmm. the president come into Newtown and he wow. met with all of the families wow. and, um, and, and we were getting so much love from around the world and incredible uh, messages from people. If you can imagine being held up in the world's prayers, it was so powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I wanted to remember it. I had somebody come in that said, you know, this is a very sacred time. So so be present and and really feel Jesse because he's around you now. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, I wanted to feel him and mm -hmm. get any messages possible. So I was very present during that time. But despite that, I found myself at the end of the week uh, after his funeral, kind of forgetting what had happened during each day. And so I sat my family down and started this journal. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, what happened on the first day? So I got all of, you know. Your so whole I family, now you have a son. Yes, I had, uh, he was 12 years old, his name is JT. And then I have three brothers and their wives and their kids and my mother and father and their significant others. So we all sat in a room and uh -huh. we, uh, just kind of detailed everything that had happened. And so from there, I just continued to write. Mm -hmm. And so this and, book. And you're a horsewoman, right? I am. I wondered, is that, has that been healing and helpful for you to be oh around gosh. animals? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, horses are so healing. I've heard that. And they're used a lot in therapy. They are. And yeah. actually, I have a really good friend in, uh, in Newtown, mm -hmm. Zor Ridge who does equine therapy. Wow. And I have to tell you that my mother and my son and I did one session of equine therapy. And it was, I, we found out things about ourselves that, you know, wow. you would, would never come out in, in regular amazing. therapy probably. Now, how about incredible. Jesse's dad? Jesse's dad uh, lives in a town over. And, okay. you know, we were separated. So uh -huh. um, he's struggling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he had no other children and lives alone. And it's uh -huh. really tough. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mary, why don't we get into your story? Because I want to talk. We've heard how high profile, mm -hmm. you know, this is with all this, you know, information and coming, loving and all that coming in. And I think there's another little side to that, too. Some people that want to 
kind of play off of it and get some recognition, maybe mm -hmm. some Absolutely. of the, the side part of it. But Mary, tell us about your story in the 60s about Michael. Yeah, we were um, 20. Now, wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. Was your dad gover governor then? He Nelson was. Rocket? He was governor yeah. of New York. Wow. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but he was also being thought of Run to for, president. for president. I remember right. that. So yeah. there was a lot of And he was a very publicity. charismatic man. Yes. He, w he was, you know, everyone knew him in the United States. He wasn't a... Right. He, he was well, a the voice family out there. was already right. quite well known, so yep. I think this compounded the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, Michael uh, graduated from Harvard and then spent a year in uh, an army uh, service. Oh, let me say one thing. He was your twin. And he was, because well, we that's did the most not important know thing that. For me, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's definitely my twin brother, right? And um, and is my twin brother. Right. That's very important for twins. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we, I mean, he decided, and he was, he loved art, and my father had collected in, or was collecting indigenous art and. Um, Michael, as a very young boy, was on the board of the Museum of Primitive Art, which my father started here in New York, ah. which then later became a, a big department at the, at the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Museum where you went and saw the yeah, collection yeah. that Michael made in New Guinea. So right. he went to New Guinea to do two things. One is to be um, a sound recorder for an anthropological film that Harvard was doing. And he did that for about four or five months. And then he took his first trip, to, that was in the highlands of New Guinea. Wow. Then he took his first trip down to the Asmat, which is on the southern coast of New Guinea. And he started to, um, he, uh, he was with this wonderful anthropologist, Audrey Herbrantz, and the two of them went around and they began to, Michael began to see that he knew that these people were incredible sculptors. Mm -hmm. And so he began to um, figure out what art he wanted to collect. This is probably the mo most remote section of the whole world. Wow. And it's nothing but um, jungles. It's, on, it's, it's a coastal area, um, maybe 150 miles of coast line there with jungles and huge, huge rivers deltas as big as the Hudson River. Wow. And um, on the second trip that he made, where he had, uh, and he had made all, he had designated all these objects and mm -hmm. done the, made the relationships with the indigenous people to buy these objects, tobacco, tools. This is an area of mud and water and trees growing out of water and jungle. So mm -hmm. they have no tools, mm -hmm. they have no stones. So tools are very important to them. So that's what he traded these things for. Mm -hmm. And he made meticulous notes about the, the different styles that were there. He was, a, he was quite an extraordinary young man for his age. Yeah. He was only, we were 23 at the time. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, so then his, I know we have a short time, but his, his boat capsized because he tried to cross the delta of this huge Elandan River and in order to save some time and not go up a back mm -hmm. smaller river. Mm -hmm. And he was on a small catamaran made of two, two canoes with a platform mm -hmm. and a little house over the platform. Wow. And it capsized. Well, first it swamped and then the outboard motor that ran it um, was dead. And then it started to be taken out to sea by this huge current. Mm. And then it actually capsized also. They tried to move everything on top mm -hmm. of the roof. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole thing capsized. And so he went out to swim. So we then think, he, and he yes, he, they, and they, they went way out and then he swam. And his, the man he was with, the two boys that were with them, that were translating in these local villages, uh, swam very early. Mm -hmm. And they managed to, to get to shore. Nobody thought they were going to be able to. And that's wow. the reason that the companion that Michael had with him actually lived. Wow. Michael, mm -hmm. after a night, uh, the next morning, he decided there was no other way for them because there's, it's complete, there's nothing mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, so he swam, he and then swam, he disappeared, and, he and then disappeared. your dad heard about it. And I remember you told us that you went over to New Guinea with your dad. Yes, I did. But what was interesting was we never knew. We knew this story, but we didn't know he had a twin. Right. Yes. I think that is that's so interesting. And, and there was some controversy about how he died, right? Like, well, that's the big sadness of it is right. that I mean. You know, he could have drowned. Right, right. Um, he was more than 10 miles from shore. Mm -hmm. um, if mm -hmm. by some amazing thing, he could, because he was fighting a current mm -hmm. and everything, he yeah. made it to shore. The story goes that he was killed and that these were headhunting tribes. Yeah. And that yeah. This so that happened. gets me into yeah. this. Yeah. What I think is yeah. interesting is that. But we knew no, that it might have, you know, there were yeah. all these things about piranhas and headhunters and all that, but we didn't know he had a twin. Right. So what, I'm, what, what comes to me for that is high profile, you do have your own quiet story. Well, it's and then true. the newspapers produce all these uh, well, or it's, whatever. It's like, it's like the, after the 9-11, and you guys can both relate to this, the world lost a hero, but you lost your brother, your twin brother, and your son. Yeah. So, you know, everybody thinks it's their loss to a certain extent. And I don't know if that can also be a burden to be, you know, in a fishbowl when you're grieving, if there's some negative downsides to all that yeah. also. I think it's interesting because I was thinking about this. I was actually talking to my husband this morning at breakfast. And I think the thing that I felt that, and, and maybe this isn't true of you, Scarlett, it would be interesting to hear what you have to say, but... For, for me, and I think for a lot of people who are thrust into a, a, a public mm -hmm. scene yeah. a, and with press and everything, they're forced into looking at the whole situation, mm -hmm. the details of it, the actual reality of it, before the body-mind is ready to take it in. Oh. And that becomes extremely more traumatizing. Mm -hmm. and, That's interesting. I mean, the press in New Guinea were absolutely horrible. Wow. I, I can't even tell you what they were like. Wow. I mean, they really were horrible. I wrote about it in my book, mm -hmm. a small amount. And, um, and then, you know, I, after I left New Guinea, I went to wait for my husband who was in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And I went to a dinner party that I didn't want to go to a dinner party, mm -hmm. but I was waiting in, in the Philippines. And I, so I had to go to the Commandant, had me there, and there were all these guests. And I mean, the woman at the dinner party the, the, the hostess said, mm -hmm. well, here's Mary Morgan, you know, and uh, blah, blah, blah about the Rockefellers, and, you know, and she's had this terrible loss, but we don't really know any of the details, but she's here to tell us all about it. Wow. Uh, at a Can dinner you party. imagine? That's unbelievable. This is, this is you know, this is um, what well, we were there yeah. for two weeks, and then, so this is the third week. Wow. And... You know, I mean, we didn't know whether Michael was dead. Right. There were still people searching for him. Mm -hmm. And so it, you can see that being in that kind of public eye, all it does is thrust you into a situation right. you're not ready to mm -hmm. handle. Yep. And also, I mean, it's interesting about... And the press is about, driving you. I didn't think of that, to, to answer the, questions you might not oh, be yeah. ready to deal oh, with. Oh, how do you feel yeah. about your brother being eaten by a shark. How do you uh, feel about piranhas him? or whatever? It, yeah. Well, it wasn't piranhas. Oh, that's just, what. Yeah. Well, that's I another somewhere. thought. I mean, <laughs> that's you know, another story. You can figure out any sadness that yeah, you, you exactly. can about this. And somebody's and saying that to you. You don't even not even sure he's dead yet. Or you no. Well, you just well, you're not. You yeah. can't take in that he could possibly yeah. be dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yes. Wow. Yes. Are you yeah. identifying with the scarlet? <clears throat> I, I am. Uh, I'm thinking that I was very very careful with myself. Mm -hmm. uh, we had meetings, uh, regular meetings with the FBI where they would be uh, investigating what happened and they'd mm -hmm. be giving us details. So these happened maybe once a month for a year. And I never went to one of those mm -hmm. because I knew that uh, I knew that I was just processing my loss. Right. And, and I knew that all those details that I couldn't handle that. Mm -hmm. And so what would happen is, you know, I'd be talking to the other families and I would hear little things and so I would think okay well if I'm hearing it I must be ready I must be able to handle it you know but um, mm. but I was very careful with yeah. myself well good for you because I I really think safety is a hugely mm. important issue after mm -hmm. death mm -hmm. 
and emotional safety. Well, yeah. also, depending well, on I mean, like 9-11, all these things, safety. I mean, mm -hmm. physical and emotional safety. And then the interesting thing is that I think I survived in New Guinea because nature creates this shock and then this numbness, and I experienced it as a kind of fog. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. that really is the, is the, the way in which the body-mind allows you to just get strength enough to be able to begin to take in the information about mm -hmm. the death. So mm -hmm. that protected you. That mm -hmm. did. So but that you didn't take it in so fast that you become overwhelmed. No, but yeah. the thing that's, that, that happens then, if there is more and more publicity or more and whatever, the question mm -hmm. is, then does that, does that protective mechanism then become um, uh, so, so that it actually works in the opposite way and keeps you from the, from the grieving experience, which, which is actually beginning to connect with your feelings mm -hmm. and beginning to, to connect with the truth of what has actually happened right. and being able to then connect with other people who are going to be the helping hands, as right. you said in your well, book. Well, I know that with the 9-11 families, one of the issues that the firefighter families had, and I did all home visits with them, is that they received too many things too big an outpouring of support, which was fine, but it became, they had so many things, teddy bears, quilts, you well, know, helmets, yes. that it, they didn't know what to do. They, it became overwhelming. You were talking about the shrine thing. Talk about that a little bit, Scarlett. Yeah, we had kind of, kind of a similar outpouring, mm -hmm. and I think that different families handled it differently. I know for me, I just thought that every Every gift that we got was mm -hmm. was loving and, and love yeah. for Jesse, and I appreciated them so much. I remember uh, coming home, because I stayed at my mom's for a little while, and then there were just boxes all over the place. And I had some friends there, and they were going to help me go through the boxes. They were telling me how they were going to sort them. And they said, okay, this is uh, keeping, this is you know giving away, this is trash, this is mm -hmm. what. And I, was like, and I said, no, I have mm -hmm. to keep them all. Yeah, mm -hmm. These were all made. Uh, the, the majority of what we got were handmade gifts from yeah. children and cards. And I said, these were all made because... These are out of love for Jesse. Mm -hmm. I have to keep everything. So to this day, they're all in my basement. But, oh my gosh! Yeah, but um, I, I, I really, I feel like, uh, you know, God doesn't give you what you can't handle. Mm -hmm. I feel like He knew that I would need all that support yeah. if I had to go through something, and I really, mm -hmm. I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've got all these boxes in your basement. I do, and, and yeah, we were talking about that before, where I had an interview in my living room, and, uh, and I'm an artist, so I have paintings on the walls all over the place. But he came in, and he was overwhelmed, and he said, so this is basically a shrine. And I started looking at it through someone else's eyes, and I saw, because I keep some things that were sent to me out. Mm -hmm. In fact, every tabletop is covered. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized, well, yeah, I guess maybe it is a little bit shriny. And then I thought about JT, who is Jesse's brother, yes, and know. you know, and how that would impact him. And I did get out a box and put some things away. Yeah. I will have to tell you, <laughs> kids count pictures, don't they, Heidi? Well, what I hear from siblings, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> what I hear from siblings really? is, is that is that you know they we love that our siblings are being recognized and honored, and we want that. But what I hear also is we need, if, if there's going to be 10 or 15 or 20 pictures of my deceased brother, I need there to be pictures of me as well around. Right. Because I need to know that I'm enough for my parents. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I'm always telling parents, don't ever, ever say that you don't want to go on anymore. Because your living children will wonder, well, am I not enough? Mm -hmm. Was it my brother that was enough and he died and I'm not enough? Mm -hmm. So, it's a tricky thing though. But mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so to, to just kind of beef up the, uh, and also the toasts, we always say it, it, it during the holidays. If you're toasting the, the, the person that died. And do toast them, by the way, yes. and ask somebody to toast thing. them. It's a, a fabulous thing yes. at dinner. So, yeah, so this, nice. this is to Scott, and he, we, we had him for 17 and a half years, and this is also to my three daughters mm -hmm. who, are, who are with me right now in the room or whatever. Bring in everybody, mm -hmm. and not just the person that's not there, because Beautiful. it sometimes makes the kids that are living wonder, wait a minute. Where am I in all this? Kind of the joke that Scott's never done anything That's wrong. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> They're angels, wrong right? For years. Yes. And it can <laughs> be hard sometimes. Yeah. Right. So I wanted to ask you both, I'll start with you, Scarlett. Tell us about your foundation and tell us what your hopes and dreams are for people and for Jesse's memory. 
Yes. Well, also with that nurturing, healing, love message, um, that's a it actually creates a powerful and profound formula for choosing love. So using Jesse's example of courage, um, and then uh, nurturing means loving kindness and gratitude, healing means forgiveness, and love is compassion and action. Actually, when you practice those four character values in that order, you are choosing love. And so we actually have a signature program. It's called the Choose Love Enrichment Program, pre-K through 12th grade. We're piloting it now in schools. It's my belief that the whole tragedy started with an angry thought in Adam Lanza's head, an angry thought. Mm -hmm. And an angry thought can be changed. Mm -hmm. And so giving kids um, the uh, social emotional skills that they need to have healthy relationships, to understand and manage their emotions, um, just everything that leads to happiness, uh, including these character values that we, um, we teach the program under this umbrella of a formula for choosing love. So that is all mm -hmm. free. I all the resources it. are free. And uh, so we're just offering that to schools. And in, in exchange, we love to hear back from the educators and how their experience has been. And, and that is really getting Jesse's message into right. the schools. And we've had incredible, incredible feedback. We, we know of one life that we've saved. Wow. Um, somebody who was hospitalized for suicide. So we go to find Choosing Love. Yeah. Mary, how do we get all yeah. your information? And what do you have hopes and dreams for Michael? Well, Michael's legacy is just wonderful. I mean, what he mm -hmm. did is there for everybody. Yes, yeah. go really to the is. museum. It's, it's, I, yeah. I, I go online and look at it, too. I'm sure twins, it's there. terms for me, what's come out of this is really the, the desire to break the isolation that surrounds twins, mm -hmm. especially in, in bereavement. Since 1967, since 1980, there's 76% more twins and growing all the time. Right, in you're right, that's a big program. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that means that at some point one twin's gonna lose the other. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be much more understood Our about twins. that. Research needs to be done. So that's m been my desire also to work with individuals. I, as much as I love doing workshops and, uh, and larger formats like that and I've you Open love it, Columbia. so you're here I, in I New York. I love working with individuals. Okay. Yeah, and I'm 78, so I'm and I am trying to balance how all of that works at this age. But and so people can get your book. On they that. certainly can get my book when grief calls forth the healing because when I grief believe, calls forth the healing. Yeah. Okay, Amazon and yours is. I'm gonna be calling you for therapy. Well, <laughs> what's your book? Be good. Nurturing Healing Love. Okay, you can go to Amazon and get both these fabulous women's books. And thank you so much for being on the show today. You guys are wonderful and fabulous. Absolutely. Thank you, Scarlett and Mary. Thank you. This was great. And thanks for watching this show today. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and please visit us at opentohope.com. And Heidi and I always want to say, if you've lost hope, please lean on ours till you find your own, and God bless.